You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is December. We're in Advent. Mm -hmm. It's also the beginning of December, which means it is time for Searching Scripture. I'm a little sad because this is our last one with Pastor Oliphant. It is sad. Uh, It's been a great year. Yeah. It has been a great year. I'm kind of, I'm, but I'm looking forward to this study today. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting the Coffee Hour. You can find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. It is time for Searching Scripture in the December issue of The Lutheran Witness, Pastor Tony Oliphant from Redeemer Lutheran Church in Elmhurst, Illinois. Pastor, welcome back to the Coffee Hour. Always a pleasure. We are wrapping up our study in Philippians. We've been working through this throughout the year. And so today we're in chapter four, verses eight through 23. Any pre-study notes before we dig into the text today that you want us to know? Yeah. So this will be Paul wrapping up his letter to the Philippians. So he'll have a couple final instructions for them and he'll be kind of summing up the things that he's been talking about so far. And uh, he'll have a couple kind of last second surprises for them that, that he, I'm sure, would delight the people that would that would receive this letter. So we'll we'll dig into those. Oh boy, last second surprises. I like that. All right. Would you like to read the text first or should we read it as we go? Let's read it as we go. Okay. Question one. Read Philippians four, verses eight and nine. These last instructions from Paul contain lofty terms, which especially stand out. And where would the Philippians have seen or heard examples of these things? Where would we find things like this to think about and meditate upon? Toward what, or rather whom, is Paul directing the thoughts of his readers? Aren't you guys going to miss these multi-question questions? (laughs) Question one with eight parts. (laughs) (laughs) Question one, subpart A. (laughs) So our, our text for that reads, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. One of my favorite passages here. So we we could do a a word study digging into every single one of these terms that Paul's using, these really very high terms that that you know philosophers and theologians have have kind of tried to articulate exactly what these things mean. We could dig into those, but really we're, we're taking a look at where Paul is directing them. So he's trying to pull them out of the muck and mire of the paganism that surrounds them, those very base uh, things that, that you would see in things like pagan worship that you would see in, the, in a society kind of widespread there pulling them out of that. And in order to show them where these things are, uh, he continues, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So he's directing them to take a look at the example that he's giving them. Now, again, we, we've talked about this before, where it might seem at first that Paul's thinking rather highly of himself, telling the Philippians to, to, to follow his example. Uh, but we want to remember this is a time before the Gospels have made full circulation within the church, so we don't know exactly which texts the Philippians would have uh, would have access to as far as the four Gospels go. Uh, and so most of the time, they're going to be just receiving the, the Gospel, the Word of Christ, from the preachers that uh, Paul himself and those that he left behind in, uh, in Philippi. And so we have the example here is that they're going to follow the, the words and the actions of Paul as he is reflecting the words and the actions of Christ. And so here he's going to be directing them to that. And you know, we can we can do that too. If we if we think about the way that we learn things as humans, we learn by example. You know, we learn to tie our shoes by watching someone else tie our shoes hundreds of times, right? And then we practice it, and then we're not very good at it, and then we get better at it, right? And so Paul's encouraging the same way that he, with his spiritual children, that you would with just a regular child who's growing up, to, to follow the examples that are set before them so that then they're on the way. They're on the path, recognizing that they're going to reach maturity later on. This has been another theme that Paul has been discussing. And so we're starting to see how all the different threads are coming together here in these last words that Paul has, these final instructions to to meditate and think about these these things that are pure and just and noble. All right. So we are, are we ready to go on to verses 10 and 11? I am if you are. Okay. 
Philippians 4, verses 10 to 11, contains Paul's thanksgiving for the gift sent by the Philippian congregation. Remember, this was a time before rapid communication. What might have prevented them from having the opportunity to send their gift earlier? Well, they didn't have Amazon. <laughs> right. Yeah, with the two-day two day shipping. Yeah, so so Paul writes, I rejoiced in the I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. So here he's he's writing to them and he's saying that he knows that they've they've had concern for him for the the gospel going out and he's aware of that. And so he's not upset by the fact that there's this delay in getting the gift to him. As the as the question no, notes there, this is the time before rapid communication. So it very may, very may well be that they just didn't know where Paul was. They didn't know what city he was in. This is kind of his M.O. He, he moves around quite a bit, sometimes because his life is at risk. So he has to get out of town quick. Other times because he's the Lord is calling him to go and establish a church in another city. We also know that Epaphroditus, from early in the letter, Epaphroditus is the messenger that the Philippians send with the gift. It might be that Epaphroditus fell ill somewhere. We do have a hint here that that he that he did face something that was life threatening. It could have been a shipwreck. There could have been any number of things. So Paul's recognizing, yep, it didn't get to him right away, and that's okay. But he and he recognizes that they were concerned for him, that they that the gift was there, and that and that not to worry. Because he's learned no matter what the situation is, that he knows how to be content. All right. Question three. In Philippians 4, verse 12, Paul speaks of the secret of contentment. But Paul does not mean mere resignation or simply accepting whatever comes his way. Rather, every situation is an opportunity for faith. He recognizes that the Lord is providing in every circumstance, whether he has more than enough or is living on nothing more than daily bread. How can abounding in earthly goods be a challenge to faith? How can lack challenge it? All right. So here Paul uses a word that really would have caught their interest where he writes, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. This word secret really it would have kind of sent up a flag for the Philippians because they, they, all throughout the Roman Empire, and this is something that, that was inherited from Greek culture, particularly Philippi is in Greece, the, these mystery cults or these secret cults uh, that would gather and they had these secret rituals that they would perform. You kind of had to, you, you had to be invited in, but you kind of had to have the means to make sure that you got invited in. And so these would have been these these secret cults, these where they would have had their secret ceremonies and their rites, and this would have been some kind of blessing from a god or a goddess that would have then guaranteed them to have some kind of earthly success, to have plenty, or to have a, a better station in the afterlife. And so the Philippians are going to hear Paul talking about this, the secret of content the secret of contentment, the secret of facing plenty and hunger. Now, what Paul's doing is he's actually flipping this idea in its head rather than, than kind of holding the secret to himself and saying, all right, if you buy in, you can, you can have a part of this. No, he's, he's publishing it, just telling it to everyone that, that he knows the secret, not just of having this earthly surplus, but also of facing hunger, facing hunger, not just be, not just abounding, but also being in need. And so what he's doing is he's, he's applying this concept through the theology of the cross, that these things are sometimes, that these things are hidden under their opposites, that life is often hidden under death, that abounding is hidden under need and suffering. And so we have here Paul saying that he knows this secret and he's going to share it with them. And so he, he, he knows how to live no matter what's going on. And so he's about to tell them the secret here with verse 13. Mm. Missed opportunity there. He could have charged twenty nine ninety nine, <laughs> done a book tour. Oh, exactly right. Yeah, the secret. Oh wait, somebody else used that. That's name. copyright now. Yep, that, somebody right. else used that <laughs> name. Never mind. That one might be copyrighted. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> Anything else on verse twelve before we go on to verse thirteen? 
Um, I, I think this is about it. And when we talk about, you know, facing contentment or having contentment, one of the question kind of drives at this is that when Christians talk about it, we're not just talking about kind of mere resignation to the fact that, that we have or that we don't have. It's not just kind of the, the sigh and saying, well, I guess this is the way that things are, but rather to recognize that no matter what the Lord has, has deemed to give us, that we can be happy with that and not just like, not just kind of bare bones satisfied and like where we pray thy will be done because you're going to do whatever you want to do. Like that's not what thy will be done means, right? It, it means that we recognize that whatever God is doing, it's completely by grace and it's for our good, whether we can see it or not. And so the contentment that we have is actually this opportunity for faith to really hold on and to say, yeah, what God is giving me is good. The, the, that my physician won't put any poison in my medicine, that he's not going to have this kind of backsided blessing. But we have these this this recognition that our Lord is always going to be providing for us, whether it's just enough that we need or whether we're abounding. You know, this is this is what the Proverbs get at when it says, Give me neither rich riches nor poverty, lest I be full and have plenty, and say, Who is the Lord? Or that I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Um, that there's this recognition that uh, there's a danger and a temptation to both sides. That when we have too much, we get a little bit complacent and we start to trust in our own abilities, in our own wealth, whatever we've accumulated. And that that's just as much a temptation as not having enough. We're not thinking that we have enough, rather. <laughs> and so then we can see here that Paul's saying that true Christian contentment is recognizing whatever I have is what the Lord has given me. And the Ten Commandments are built on this, that we don't covet what God has given to others. We don't try to take what God has given to others through legal or illegal means, but that we actually help our neighbor improve and pos- improve and protect his possessions and income because that's what the Lord has given them. And that's what the Lord has given me. We have more to study in Philippians chapter 4 today with Pastor Oliphant. We'll continue the conversation in just a moment. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golsa. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others. To live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world. To live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We are searching scripture in the December issue of The Lutheran Witness, and we are moving on to Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. The question, well, Philippians 4, verse 13 is a very famous verse. It is also often not used as Paul originally intended. It is not a mantra for power or personal victory. Read Philippians 4, 13 with the rest of the paragraph before it. How does this help us understand what Paul is saying? And how is this verse more about God than about our endurance or power? Uh, so Philippians 4.13 is a, it's a favorite, if often misquoted verse. If we just take it by itself, it reads, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And a lot of times people will use that as to say, you know, I just, I just have to pray a little bit more and then God will help me run really fast in this race. Or he'll help me cut, catch that, the winning touchdown pass. Or that I can I can start my new business because God's going to empower me to do it. But really, if we take a look at where this sentence falls, it's right after Paul has said, "Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me." This is really more about what God is doing for us, no matter what our situation is, whether it looks like we're succeeding and winning, or if it looks like we're suffering and losing and being in need. 
that that God will bring us through both of those situations. And so this kind of this ties into the way that the Lord's prayer is structured, where we pray, give us this day our daily bread. We ask for forgiveness, and then we ask not to be led into temptation. No matter what the situation we find ourselves in, that this is really looking to God to provide us what we need and then to lead us through that situation, whatever we have, so that we don't fall off on either side of the, that that temptation was talking about in Proverbs that that seems to be in Paul's mind as he's talking here. So it's unfortunately it's not about it's not like a, a sneaker commercial where you're gonna if you just if you just <laughs> pray this verse that God is gonna make you a great athlete or whatever. And I hate to burst everyone's bubble, but you know I had to experience that myself. So, but learning that this is actually more about that God will preserve us no matter what our situation is. There's a lot more comfort, I think, that can be derived from that. Rather than asking what we're doing wrong, we're saying, this is what God is doing right. Yeah. That's a great message. All right. Question five. Read Philippians 4, verses 14 through 20. Paul continues his thanks for the Philippians' gift. Even though this gift was delivered to him, he describes it as a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. How can a gift given to a human be a sacrifice to God? See Matthew 25, verse 40. What does this teach us about our own gifts and offerings? All right. So Paul is going to here be a continuing his, his thank you note to the Philippians. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, So here we see that, you know, Paul is saying, yes, you gave this gift to me, um, that Epaphroditus delivered it to me. He does recognize that he is a mortal man. And yet it's spoken of here as being a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. We can hear what Jesus has uh, taught us, you know, last week with the parable of the sheep and the goats. So with the end of the church here, when we have the the son of man returns and separates the nations and divides them, the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. And he tells the sheep, um, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink, etc." And they're a little bit confused as to when they ever did this for him. So, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And notice those are the things that the Philippians did for Paul. And the king will answer them, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of these, one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And so Jesus is actually taking the good works that we do here on earth. And he says that they're done for him. And so we can see that the, the things that we do, the tithes and offerings that we offer to our church, the, uh, the charities that we support, the kind actions and words that we do for people that God puts around us, that these are offered to God, that these are our, our sacrifices of love that are offered, that the Lord then says we're done for him. And so this is one of those really amazing things we have in Lutheran theology, where God is always kind of God is always hiding behind these masks of other people, whether he's providing for us and he's hiding behind this mask of giving us daily bread through the people around us, or whether he's using us as a mask to provide for others. But then also he's hiding behind the mask of those that we're helping so that we help them. Yes, but we're also serving God through that as well. Except mine don't smell as much. <laughs> so they're not fragrant offerings. <laughs> Let's see. Ready to go on to verses 21 and 22. I am if you are, if we don't need to dive into the the fragrance anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Philippians chapter 4, (laughs) verses 21 and 22 contains Paul's farewell greeting, telling the Philippians he is not alone and 
that even some of Caesar's household are now believers. What does this teach us about the makeup and fellowship of the church in terms of social class and rank? So, yeah, this is that kind of last second surprise that he has for them where he says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. And remember, this is what Paul is writing while he's under house arrest in Rome. And what this does is it tells us that the gospel has even made inroads into Caesar's own household, that there are members of the emperor of his, of his household that have been brought to the faith. And that they're sending their greetings to the Philippians. Now, could you imagine this? If you're the Philippians, you're writing to someone that you really care about. You know that he's under arrest, that he's facing trial for being a Christian. And he says, hey, you know, there are some people that belong to Caesar that are Christians too. And they send their greetings. This is, I mean, that would have blown the top of their head off. It would have, I mean, it would have just been amazing for them to read that, that the gospel has made these inroads, even, you know, in the kingdom of darkness, the the Roman Empire is not depicted well in in Scripture, particularly in the Book of Revelation. Right? That this is the, the kingdom, the kingdom of the beast. Yeah. Uh, this is Babylon, and yet Paul's saying, "Yep, there's still some that God is, God is saving here. He's not alone. That the saints are with him, and that there are even some believers who are found, you know, in in the deepest depths of the devil's kingdom. And so this, you know, this is encouragement for them." So that, you know, they, they can know that he's well taken care of. This also really represents, this this reflects something that's been unique about the church that kind of stymies sociologists that most of the time when you have societies, they're going to be built out of similar class makeup, class structure. They're going to be built off of common interests, things like that. Just think about, you know, the number of clubs that someone can join. Yet the church kind of cuts through social distinctions. This is this is apparent all over Scripture. Whether it's the Old Testament where God is saying that He's going to bring Gentiles to His holy mountain, or whether it's the New Testament where he, where Paul says there's neither Greek nor Jew, right, male or female, not rich or poor, that all of them belong to the same church, and that fact, in fact, making distinctions between them is something that's wrong that the church shouldn't be doing, that the the rich shouldn't get the better seats and make the poor sit at their feet. This is one of the things that He really comes down on some of the congregations that are practicing this. But here we see that, yeah, this is the, the church is actually made up of people from every language, every social class. And this is one of those things that it shouldn't be, right? It's not how humans behave. Like goes to like. But here we see that the church is across the board, throughout the world, across cultures and languages, socioeconomic status, that this is something that only the Holy Spirit can do. And so this is another good reminder to the Philippians that, that God is really working amazing wonders within the church. All right. Last question. Read Paul's benediction in Philippians 4, verse 23. What word in this closing blessing was also in the opening of his epistle? What does this teach us about where all good gifts begin and end? So Paul writes, the grace of, of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. He began this letter by saying grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. This tells us that everything begins and ends with God's grace. The Philippians are not receiving gifts because they've done something, but rather they're doing these things for Paul because God has already poured out his grace on them. And really, this is our understanding, too, that everything that we do, whether it's a good work, whether it's a material gift, whether it's an act of service or words of encouragement, All of these things come from the gifts and encouragement and service that we've received from Christ himself. Anything to wrap up this series or today's text? Final thoughts? You know, I think that Paul sums it up really well by just putting everything back under the title of grace. That his thanksgiving for the Philippians is first and foremost because they've received the gospel. And then the outward showing of their faith through these works of love. Paul gives thanks for that. And then he's always going to bring them back to this fact that everything that they've given, they've already received from God. And that that's not going to ever, we're, we're set free to do these things without worrying what the cost is because Christ is so, so abundant, so, has so abundantly provided for us that we we can't help but give all of this, all these gifts to others. We can't help but serve others because we have this 
amazing abundance that can never be exhausted in Christ. And so this is going to be Paul's general theme here is thank you to the Philippians and thanks be to God for everything that he's done for the Philippians that's led them to this. Our guest for this series has been Pastor Tony Oliphant of Redeemer Lutheran Church in Elmhurst, Illinois. Pastor Oliphant, thanks so much for helping us search God's Word, search Scripture this year, and thanks for being a a good sport and uh, coming on with us each month to to dig into this text. We really appreciate your time and, and wisdom. It's been a joy. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you. Anytime. Anywhere. Anywhere.